Hi, my name is Nikki Shaheed from Birthing From Within International. I am a trainer for Birthing From Within International, and I've also been a childbirth mentor and a doula for eight years. I am the author of Heart Centered Pregnancy Journal, as well as the Heart Centered Pregnancy Card Deck. I also know that a lot what you do in your work or with your colleagues is you use different tools to um, in your teaching and some of those tools are myths some of those tools are stories um, and from what i know those are used to tap into our unconscious so to go into the knowledge that um, is allowing for us to come closer to the understanding of that initiation process closer to the understanding of that transformation knowing that that transformation is on several levels, right? So on levels, on the physiological level, the emotional level, the psychological level, the level of our um, interaction with the society, ourselves. Um, so why do we use these myths and these stories and these initiations and rituals in preparation? Why that? Yeah. So sharing myths or great stories activates many different parts of the brain right? So the brain is more lit up, it's more ready for learning, and we also retain that information longer. Humans are meaning-making creatures, naturally, right? Everything is a story for us. Everything is a story. We have a story of what it means to be a parent, of what it means to be a partner, of what it means to give birth, of what the postpartum period means, right? And so we're just tapping into what's already there, and a friend once told me that there's a million year old person inside of each of us just waiting to sit around a fire and hear a story, right? So great stories give context to what we're experiencing, especially when we are going through an ordeal, when we're going through an initiation, it helps us kind of find ourselves within that map while we are in it. And it also helps us feel alone. It reminds us that what is happening now is what has always happened. Right? And it's speaking more to that mindset piece. So this is getting a little bit away from the maps and the tools and really helping people cultivate a mindset where the story is the teacher, the story is imparting wisdom, right? And they can start to listen for what does this story have to do with me? Where do I see myself in this story? How do these different characters show up in my life, but also how are each of them representative of a part of myself, right? And we do this automatically. We drop in and we start to experience stories, especially well-told stories, as if we are in that story, right? So it's a really great tool to help people place themselves within that process of initiation. Um, do you have a favorite story? Do you have a favorite myth um, that's really dear to you or you use a lot in your practice? I have a few that are favorites of mine, um, but when I am talking to expecting parents, I would say the story of Inanna is definitely my favorite. Could you share a little bit of it? I know it might be a long story. Could you share kind of maybe a quick summary or the main points to those who may not know the story of Inanna? Yeah, so the, the story of Inanna has been around for thousands of years, and it comes from ancient Sumer, which is modern day Iraq. Um, they found this story in a tomb in the 1920s, and then they spent decades translating the cuneiform to um, find a lot of different things, right? Some of them were just receipts for grain, <laughs> um, but others were great stories and hymns and myths, and they found the story of Inanna's descent in that tomb. So the story is about Inanna, who is a warrior, a poet, a priestess, a very powerful woman who hears a call to the underworld. And so she has to close down her everyday life, right? The things that kind of define who she is, and also gather up her queenly items to prepare for her journey that will keep her safe or feel like they're part of her identity. So when Inanna goes off to the underworld, her best friend wants her to not go. Right, her best friend in says, no one comes back from the underworld unscathed or unchanged, don't do this. And Inanna in her wisdom gives Ninshabur, her best friend, a task to watch the sun rise and set for three days, right? And then get help if she's not back. So she creates the safety net for herself and then goes down into the underworld and passes through many gates, right? So at each gate, 
Neti, the gatekeeper of the underworld, takes something from her that really feels like it's part of who she is, right? It's her, it's her royal cloak or it's her royal crown. It's something that's been passed down for generations and something is taken and then she is asked, who are you without this thing, right? So that by the time she gets to the throne room of the underworld, she's humbled, she's stripped of all of her uh, masks or her roles in life, and she's bowed low. And there she meets Arishka Gom, which is the other side of herself, right? So Inanna has been living it up in the underworld, her whole, excuse me, the upper world her whole life. And, you know, she represents the parts of herself that are accepted that gain her love that gain her approval and any time in life that she didn't get love and approval for something that was sent down to the underworld right and that's Arishka go so now that she meets Arishka go Inanna falls dead on the floor right the person she was is no longer much like when your baby is born you are not the same person anymore and so there's this period where she's in between her body's hung on a hook she can't get down herself but, but her best friend has been watching out for her. So when Inanna doesn't call, come back after three days, the best friend goes to the wise elders and asks them for help. And some of them judge Inanna and some of them say she shouldn't have gotten herself into this in the first place. But the one who has been to the underworld and clawed his way out, Grandfather Enki, gives, um, gives Ninchaber two little tiny allies who can slip under the gates through the keyholes and go down to the underworld. And they do not go to Inanna first. I think this is so important. They go to Arishkigal first and they tend to Arishkigal. They tend to the part of her that has been pushed down and suppressed for decades and first show her love and compassion. And then they're able to take Inanna down off the hook and sprinkle her with the food and water of life. And finally, she has the strength, the strength to begin her journey back to the upper world. And she's only allowed to go under certain conditions. She has to agree not to abandon her long lost sister in the underworld. So the person who leaves is the integrated self, right? The light and the shadow, the parts of ourselves that gain acceptance and the parts that don't gain acceptance. Having compassion and valuing all of those parts is the key to getting home. That's a beautiful story. And I've had all these pictures in my mind. You gave me just enough information to paint almost a book, uh, but then I could choose, you know, my own colors. And uh, yeah. that's very, very beautiful. Do you usually use this story um, only with women or with their partners as well? Um, are myths and stories as effective when you are supporting um, not the birthing woman, but her partner as well? Absolutely. These are effective for partners as well to have some context and some understanding of what's happening on a soul level within the birth giver, right? Like we can look at charts and models and pictures and videos, but to understand the internal struggle of what the birth giver is going through is very powerful for partners uh, when it comes to supporting their loved one. Thank you. Thank you for that. And now I'd love for us to transition. We've spoken a little bit about preparation. We've spoken about the tools that we use to tap into the unconscious, to speak to that initiation, to create visuals for it, to really tell the story. And now I'd like for us to speak a little bit more about postpartum. Um, and I, my first question would be, does preparing for birth also prepare us um, for postpartum? So the mindset pieces around initiation that we've been speaking of are incredibly important for postpartum because it's not only in birth that we meet uncertainty. It's not only in birth that we're not sure what to do next. It's not only in birth that we feel overwhelmed, fatigued, doubtful, uncertain, right? So all of those same mindset pieces, those mindset tools that we cultivate during pregnancy can be applied in postpartum. So if a person has prepared to meet the unknown prenatally, then it will serve them well in postpartum as well. Great. And can our birth experience or the woman's birth experience become a support pillar? Could it be something that um, is 
empowerment that's not only empowerment in the moment, but something that is an empowering experience or even a pillar. I like the idea of a pillar, something that creates stability for us post the birth. You know, I think it could become empowering. Um, one of my goals when I do birth story work is for the story to become integrated. And if part of that integration is empowerment, then so be it. Um, but really, I want it to, I want to help the person fit that story into their life and help them use it as a tool for learning about themselves rather than a tool for self-judgment. All right, so to ask themselves, what did I learn about myself that I couldn't have learned any other way? What do I know now that I couldn't have known before? What did I do when I didn't know what to do? How did I find help maybe even in unexpected places during the birth? So when we can frame it within the context of initiation, then the birth can become a powerful learning tool and a way to integrate that experience instead of a way to use it against yourself. And in the situation when a woman has diligently prepared um, in ways that um, allowed her to prepare her mindset, to prepare the map, to prepare her village, the people around her, but for whatever reason, the birth went in a way that left her with frustration or left her with disappointment. Um, maybe it's something where an expectation uh, and the reality didn't match or for whatever reason um, it just wasn't the way that she or her family has hopeful has hoped for um, how can a family heal from that best so you know since we've talked about the story of Anana I'm going to put it within the context of Anana I think it is helpful to think about the Arishkigal moment right the moment when the birth giver met the part of themselves that has been suppressed and pushed down and told this part of you can't come out this part of you is unlovable right to find that moment and ask yourself how do i know to judge myself over this right what is causing me to hold on to um, so much self-judgment why is this awakening my inner critic Right, and more often than not, it's going to come from that unconscious preparation for birth, right? You're going to identify a long held belief that you shouldn't rock the boat or the doctor knows best, you know, whatever it may be. And then that belief gets the opportunity to grow up, right? So when you were young and you made that agreement with yourself, it made total sense and it helped you to feel safe and it helped you to get love and belonging. But now as adults, our responsibility is to look at, well, what do I already know about what it takes to get love and belonging? And if you're not sure, look at your baby, right? What does your baby have to do to be lovable and to belong? Nothing, nothing, right? They are inherently lovable. And so if you can love your inner Inanna and your inner Arishkigo, then the two can be integrated and they can walk out of the underworld together. And this process takes time. I don't want to make it sound like it's something simple or a snap of the fingers, right? It takes time for the dust to settle and for people to make sense of their birth experience. But just using this myth is one of many ways that people can help to integrate that story. Sounds like that birth story integration, I like the word integrate, is a big piece of it. Is there anything else in it, for example, certain um, environment, certain kind of people, any other ways to help that integration process? So I think one is the mental part, but what else can I do, for example, as a woman, uh, maybe it's surrounding myself with certain things or certain people or certain ways of doing things to heal right heal from an experience that could be traumatic or heal from experience that um maybe not traumatic but just big so much bigger than me than my family and feels like you know kind of like the universe big yeah you know again i'll, I'll refer back to the story of anana when her best friend and shabur went to get help first people rejected her or judged anana or said she should have known better right and then finally, Ninshaba found Grandfather Enki, that compassionate person who had been initiated. 
who had integrated his own heroic journey into the underworld, right? That was the person who could help her out. So one of the lessons that we can learn from this is to not give up, right? To not give up when one person um, can't hear us, when someone rejects us, or when someone just doesn't know how to listen to a birth story in a mindful or compassionate way, right? To keep searching until you find those people who can really understand on a heart level what you've been through. Could we say that integration of that story is something that allows for closure? I think for a lot of people it can bring closure, yeah. For those families or for those parents who are looking for something they might call, let's say, hard signs, um, or something that they like, the factual information, the statistics behind things. Um, when we introduce them to a narrative approach, when we use the myths, is there any scientific base behind it? Is there any research finding on using these stories? Because we know they work. Absolutely, yes. Um, so the science has shown us that people light up different parts of their brain when they're hearing a great story, right? So we're not just engaging the neocortex or the sensory part of the brain, but really many different parts of the brain are being lit up. Um, and it's also shown that people retain information, I think it's 22% longer when they hear it in story form versus when it's just a bunch of information that's handed to them. With the narrative approach, with the stories, it might feel quite foreign or unfamiliar to the women in modern days. Mm -hmm. um, so to those families, those women, how do you work with them if they say, that's not a good fit for me? That's maybe works for some, some other people, but for me, I'd like to take a different approach. Um, could you work with them? How do you work with them? I could definitely work with them. And, and one of the reasons this is so is that I am not a teacher, but a mentor, right? And so a mentor has to meet people where they are and has to be responsive to those parents' needs, you know? So I don't, I don't work from a predetermined plan of what I will cover with people or what I will share with a class. Um, I really have to take in the energy that they're giving me and what they're telling me and showing me that they need and then respond to that in turn. Um, I would also say as a mentor, it's very important for me to build trust and rapport with parents, right? So I spend a lot of time in my classes building that trust and rapport so that I can take people to unfamiliar places. So that even if hearing a myth or hearing a great story feels kind of weird or feels like, how is this going to really help me prepare for birth? I've also established a level of trust that makes most people pretty willing to go there. All right, now if I'm working with someone one-on-one -on -one and this is just not their thing, then what I need to do as a mentor is pivot and find a different approach. Just the same way that I want parents to be cultivating flexibility and creativity and the ability to be in the moment and ask themselves the question, what does this moment call for? That's my job as a mentor as well. Great, that's very uh, versatile job that you have. I think it's a role where you are present, fully present, and at the same time think on your feet. So for all those people who want to read more of your work, who want to know more about you, who want to know more about um, the style of your work, the school of your work, um, who want to read your books, where can they go? Where can they get those resources, that information to take a deeper dive? Yeah. So the way that I approach birth um, is all informed by the birthing from within philosophy. So I would encourage people to visit birthingfromwithin.com for um, resources both for parents and for birth professionals. So you can find out more about my work at nikishahid.com. And again, there's information there for parents and for birth professionals um, and information about my book and my card deck there as well. So if you're wanting to read more of my work, um, I wrote Heart Centered Pregnancy Journal, and then there's also the Heart Centered Pregnancy card deck uh, that people can order and check out. Could you speak a little bit more about the Heart Centered Pregnancy Journal and the card deck? Um, do they go together or do they go separately? And it's called a journal. So what is that? Um, does it make it a book? Does it make it a workbook? 
Yeah, it is a workbook. Um, there's a lot of blank space in there for you to write. I encourage people to bend the pages, increase the spine, and just make a mess in that book because it is a space for your own inner exploration. And the book is written based on the premise that you come into birth with a wealth of knowledge, with a wealth of experiences. And so what I want to help people do is kind of excavate those gems, excavate what they already know about getting through hard things and staying connected and showing up and doing their best. All right, so the book is full of journaling prompts that help you get ready for birth by excavating what you already know. Now, as far as the card deck goes, they can be bought together or they can be bought separately. Um, and people tend to use the card deck, especially birth professionals, they'll use it in classes and just kind of pull a card and say, okay, let's talk about intuition. Let's talk about self-acceptance, right? Um, so that's, that's one way that people use it. And sometimes pregnant people will just pull a card a day and either journal about it or discuss it with their partner or treat it like a meditation for them to think about and reflect on. Do you think it could be of value to those who are not pregnant yet? Yes, I do. You know, I, I don't think there's ever a bad time to learn more about ourselves and cultivate more resilience and self-compassion.